Hey everyone, Duog Ross here for War Games Review. Today I'd like to take a little different approach to one of my videos and I'll be reviewing the rules, or my first impression of the rules, for the tabletop war game Field of Glory. Now just to let you know, there is a set of video games with the same name, along the same vein, same subject matter, same software development company and everything, but this review is specifically for the tabletop war gaming rules and this is the ancients and medieval variety in case that matters to you. So I purchased the Field of Glory rule book uh, a few days ago and just fair warning I am kinda late in coming to this game. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly it was actually developed or the playtest started in around 06, 07 and I believe the official publishing was late 08, maybe late early 09. Uh, please don't quote me on that. But Field of Glory is a uh, as the title says there, or the line down at the bottom, Wargaming Rules for Ancient Medieval Tabletop Gaming. This is my first uh, trip into historical wargaming. Uh, if you followed my blog or any of my YouTube channels, you know I've played uh, Warhammer for a while now, probably about three years of the fantasy variety. Um, and I've really enjoyed that. Just uh, all along, I've really wanted to get into um, historical wargaming. And I wrote earlier on my blog some of the reasons why or what my thought process was in terms of why, why I chose Field of Glory as opposed to another gaming system such as Warhammer Ancient Battles. Uh, that's not the purpose of this video. It's just to give you my impressions as a total rookie to the field, let you know how I feel about it. And frankly, it's kind of a commercial for Field of Glory because I had a very positive experience based on my first impressions. So digging in, the first thing you notice with the book, it's a hardcover book. Um, it's uh, over 100 pages long. Uh, I think it's actually around 150. Uh, we'll see some examples at the end. Uh, first of all, it's just a beautiful book. The book itself is uh, hardcover, bound. It's publishing level material. It's nicer, frankly, than a lot of textbooks that I had in college. Uh, this is just uh, an example of some photos I took of the book, and that's what I'm going to use to share my thoughts and kind of guide my thoughts. Um, I tried to be as careful as I could to uh, not include anything that would be a major giveaway for the game or prevent you from buying the book. Uh, big fan of the publisher here after I looked at it, so please support the publisher, Osprey Publishing. Um, but there's a lot of beautiful illustrations in the book, even if you didn't intend to war game, just the pictures alone make it worthwhile. Um, a new copy of this book, I believe, was running for around tw anywhere from 25 to $45 US on Amazon.com, eBay, a couple other places able to find it. Um, it actually is listed on the Barnes & Noble registry. Uh, if you go to a Barnes & Noble's bookstore, the one in my town uh, didn't have it in stock, but you could hypothetically order it from there. So it's not something that's just limited to you know your local gaming club or just a, a, a small uh, niche marketing type thing. It's published by Osprey Publishing, or Osprey, depending on which pronunciation you want to use which uh, if you're familiar with them at all uh, they publish like historical material not that I've ever been into it in the past but just looking at their website you can tell it's a pretty quality organization that's one thing that this game has on uh, some of the competitors that I researched is just the quality of the publication itself kinda takes it out of that for lack of a better term nerdy basement mentality of wargaming brings it into a little more of a mainstream thought process but the layout itself as you can see here is really nice There's a lot of charts in the books that are uh, really well laid out um, in terms of tests and when you can do certain moves, when you cannot do certain moves, so it's really, really easy to follow along. Now the whole concept behind the game is that troops are based in units, essentially, uh, battle groups. Uh, so it's, it's based on a per base method, not a per model method. So, for example, you can play this in 15 millimeter or uh, 28 millimeter. Uh, I will be doing the 28 millimeter variety to make it compatible with my Warhammer figures. But uh, every base is 60 millimeters wide uh, because the width is important, and then so many millimeters deep, depending on the troop type. Uh, that is a little more easy to flub on. The most important thing is that all the bases have the same width. So, the nice thing about that to me is while there's a recommended number of number of models per base as long as you and your opponent agree you can make that base look like anything you want I mean you could play a game with pieces of paper with the name of the unit written on it uh, just 
as easily as beautifully modeled miniatures. And I already mentioned they're put in groups called battle groups, so you know you might have uh, six bases or eight bases grouped together in a battle group formation. It might be four wide, two deep. It might be two wide, four deep. Uh, there's different arrangements that go with that. Um, the concept, you know, allows flexibility without being confusing. Yeah, there's some examples right there of some permitted formations. Again, just really good quality illustrations. The movement rules for the most part are fairly simple once you get them down it seems like. Now I've only played one game so far so don't and it was a simulation game in other words I played against myself just like if I do this and then this what happens here so I'm definitely not an expert remember this is just my preliminary impressions um, but one I guess historically accurate thing about this is that some maneuvers are complicated. You have to take complex move tests based on ability, is there a commander nearby, some other factors. So, you know, your group of poorly trained militia may not be able to do a 90 degree turn to the right and then wheel to the left and advance three inches all in one turn. Uh, that's realistic. You know, and I think a, a good thing, you know, unlike Warhammer Fantasy, if you have the ability to move 18 inches forward, you will always move 18 inches forward. There's no possibility that, uh, you know, they could get a mixed up order from their general. Uh, kind of an illustration of the whole fog of war concept, um, you know, or chain of command in that, you know, the head general giving order to his lesser commanders, it's not always going to get through perfectly clearly. Um, but I don't want to go into a lot of details, but the movement itself is pretty easy. Uh, moves are based on movement units. It's not specified whether it's metric or English. Uh, the movement unit they use in the book is uh, one inch or 25 millimeters for one unit. So like a heavy inf infantry might move one movement unit. Uh, a light infantry might use five five movement units, uh, so on and so forth. Although I've read forums and things where people change the movement units. Uh, again, it doesn't really affect the rules as long as you and your opponent are using a consistent scale. Just a shot showing some more examples of the types of moves. I don't really need to go into it for the sake of this game, uh, or this video rather. Now the rules themselves, I'll admit, they're kind of thick. It's not uh, cumbersome and it's very well laid out, but it's not a game that's going to be super friendly for nine-year-olds and ten-year-olds. Um, really, it is somewhat advanced. That doesn't mean it's hard, but the first time I read through the book, you know, I get so many pages in, and I'm kind of like, okay, how does this all fit together? Because some things, just by the nature of the game, they have to reference a rule that says, you can always do this except in XYZ and they don't talk about rule XYZ for another 20 pages. So in my first time through, it felt a little complicated to understand, but uh, it does all come together eventually. And I didn't want you to think by me saying that, that the rules are cumbersome. When I said they're thick, I just meant uh, you do have to take the time to learn it. You know, it's not like playing Uno, which is good to me. I don't want an oversimplified rule set, and I think they strike a pretty good balance between simplicity and thoroughness. Um, there is an impact phase, which would be a lot like charging. Um, pretty gruesome picture here. <laughs> My wife said something like, "Well, don't let our boys read the book." And like I said, that's uh, you know that's realistic. I mean, that's how ancient medieval warfare was. Uh, impact phase is basically uh, you'll come together, you'll charge. Uh, if there's an appropriate charge, uh, sometimes chargers will charge another battle group without orders. Uh, depending on their troop type. Again, some realism worked into the game there. Uh, there is some variability that can come in that. You can evade. There can be an intercepted charge where another unit kind of comes in from the side. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, the cavalry coming to save the day. So some different variables there seemed pretty uh, realistic. And again, I don't necessarily have it all perfectly nailed at this point, but I'm getting the idea. Uh, I just put this as an example of a nice picture. Uh, reminds me of the Bretonians a little bit. Throughout the book you'll find some little tips 
like if your troops are best at impact, make sure your charges arrive with as many bases in contact as possible. Um, you know, just nice suggestions throughout the book. Another example of how combat might look, and one thing I liked is, you know, if your bases don't line up perfectly, that's okay. They do have a stepping forward mechanism for dealing with that. You know, just because it's not my front row touching your front row doesn't mean we can't fight. I mean, realistically, in a real battle, it's not like you charge in and then if there's an obstacle, the guy in the front right-hand corner of the battle fights and everybody else just stands there seven feet away from the enemy. So that's kind of cool. The maneuver phase uh, would, you know, pretty much just be what you'd think of as your regular move or your other moves. Shooting phase, I think the name pretty much says it all. And then the melee phase, and this is where we kind of start to get into uh, the combat mechanism, and I think that's where um, the game itself really shines. In the combat mechanism, everything is based on points of advantage, uh, where obviously you have a certain number of dice per base, your opponent has a certain number of dice per base, depending on the skill level of the troop, uh, the troop type, etc., etc. But it takes historical advantages and matchups into consideration. Uh, it's all based on the dice roll being modified. Um, if there were two perfectly matched uh, units, everybody would hit on a 4 plus. In other words, everybody has a 50-50 chance. If one person has a single advantage, or one side rather has a single advantage, they would hit on a 4 up and the opponent would hit on a 5 up. If one side has a double advantage, um, then the side with the double advantage hits on a 3 up and the side with no advantage, or the double disadvantage, if you will, hits on a 5-up. And that may not sound like a lot, but when you're rolling 8-9 dice in a big battle, it ends up being a pretty big deal. And that's where it's thorough, it's realistic, a lot of variables, but it's simple and easy to understand. Um, I'll show you later in the game, there's a couple quick reference sheets that I printed out from the company's website, uh, which is another great thing about the company. They have tremendous support for their players, um, I probably was able to get 50 to 75 percent of the rules I needed just off that quick reference sheet. Um, so for example, uh, if everything else is equal and one side has better armor uh, than the other side, one is heavily armored, one's lightly armored, they would get a single point of advantage. And those points of advantage are always based on a net result. So for example, if uh, one side is swordsman, which is a special ability, they might get uh, one point of advantage. And the other side has better armor, they would get one point of advantage. Well, those net out to no advantage either side. If both sides are plus one, then there's no advantage. They're both hitting on the four up. So on and so forth. Now, here's where in the book, page 102, 103, I got this far in and finally it's like a light bulb went off, everything clicked and all of a sudden it made sense because they give you an example of how the close combat actually works. Uh, so you will have had your impact phase first, you'll fight an initial impact phase combat and in that impact phase there'll be some sp special things to an impact phase uh, like obviously if you have a lance for example and you're riding a horse, uh, your impact hits are going to be different and probably more powerful than your hits in the melee phase. Melee would be ongoing combat. And I don't want to dwell on it here, but uh, again, it's really quite simplistic, but uh, kind of ingenious, or it shows ingenuity, maybe it's a better way of saying that. And then towards the end of the book, there's a section with appendices of unusual situations, illustrations, some special rules that don't come up all that often. What I found in reading the rule book is, compared to the first simulation game I played, probably 40 to 50 percent of the rules in the book never came into play. And I've heard a lot of other people say that too, that just because it's in the book doesn't mean you're going to necessarily use it very often. So don't feel like you have to memorize every rule right away. 
So in terms of product support, I think the product support is excellent. Um, here's the examples of those easy reference sheets I downloaded. Um, just printed them off. I laminated mine because I have a laminator and I would have destroyed them by now if I hadn't. But like I said, there's charts for how many dice you get in each phase, scores to hit, uh, move distances, um, you know, what is a complex move, what's not a complex move, those sorts of things. Uh, this is this part's absolutely completely free. Oh, and I mentioned earlier that uh, you know I got my books on Amazon.com. Uh, I was able to find a used copy of the rule book in really good shape for $13, including shipping. Um, and there's some supplement books too, which we'll get to in just a second. Yeah, right now, for example. So uh, one example of a supplement book is Oath of Fealty. And in this book, it'll have uh, army lists. Basically, you know, if you're playing as the Welsh, here's what their army would look like. And it gives you the choices to choose from if you're making a customized list. It also gives you starter armies for every army. Uh, if you just want to dive right in, I'll tell you, you have this many spearmen in this uh, number of battle groups, you have this many bowmen, you have this many knights, so on and so forth. Um, so the supplements are really awesome. Uh, the supplements are really cool as far as uh, just seeing all the different illustrations again, because those are filled with great artwork too. I don't want to give too much away because I want you to support the company and buy their stuff. Uh, again, you can usually find those used, you can find them new also. Uh, right now, the publisher Osprey has a lot of those uh, army supplement books marked down by four, five, six bucks each. Um, I was able to get two of them with shipping directly from the publisher for, I think, about $26 here in the United States. Uh, so really, not all that expensive at all. Part of the reason they're marking that down is because they've released a uh, Field of Glory Renaissance version. So this slightly older version's kind of taken a back seat for a while, so to drum up interest, they're uh, reducing the price on those. And then also, um, because I think, this is just my theory, they're beta testing a version 2 as well. And one other thing I was going to mention about the army supplements is that they are period-based. I didn't want to give the impression that it was just one or two armies. I think in that particular army book it covers uh, the earlier part of the medieval period from say around the year 1000 through about 1300, don't quote me on that, but somewhere in that range, and there's, I don't know, 20, 23 different armies in there um, that you can play with, you know, based on historical and geographic groupings. So uh, the back cover of the rule book here uh, means that we're almost done with this review. Just to summarize, um, I think I'm going to really like the rule set for Field of Glory. Having played one game, seems like it's got a lot of potential. Doesn't mean there aren't some snags and a few difficulties that'll take some getting used to. You know, everything has its pros and cons, but I think you know the pros outweigh the cons by a fairly large amount. And uh, hopefully I'll get to posting some uh, battle reports or at least commentaries uh, in the coming weeks uh, that you can look at and uh, make your own determination. But uh, so far, so good. And, um, you know, the main reason I did this is because I didn't see a whole lot of videos online that described it from just a, a rookie introductory viewpoint. Um, in fact, I don't know that I saw any at all. So uh, leave your comments in the sections below, visit my blog, all those uh, types of things would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the, I'll show the detailed information on the next slide here.